Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmeltzley. Welcome back to Funnel Reboot, where we explore upgrading lead generation. Today is the fourth in our series of summer books. And this one's going to dive into the hot topics swirling around the pay-per-click marketing world. But before that, let me quickly remind you, you can get new episodes as soon as they're out by going to any app that you use for audio and subscribe. As well, if you have a book that you would like featured in this series or others, send me some feedback. Twitter, Instagram, or Funnel Reboot. Or you can reach out to me, you can go onto the Funnel Reboot site, fill out the form, you can even call 613-703-7073 and leave me a message. Our guest's marketing journey began with a job at a coffee equipment supplier in Kentucky. And while there, he learned Google AdWords. It was what was used by the company to sell products on their site. Deciding to devote all his time to Google's platform, particularly their shopping ads, he left the coffee business and that whole part of the country. And for the last decade, he's been living elsewhere focused on nothing but PPC. Now, if I asked you to name places that are hotbeds for digital marketing agencies, you might say New York, L.A., Chicago, Maybe my hometown of Toronto. The author we're talking to today, though, isn't from any of those places. But he does live in a place where he can see seven mountain ranges, some with 10,000 plus foot peaks. So while it's not considered a hub city for agencies, Billings, Montana is where you'll find living with his wife and six children, our author, Kirk Williams. Anyone who's joined a Twitter chat or attended a conference session about it knows that discussing PPC stirs up strong opinions. And Kirk's not afraid to tackle these things head on. But his 2020 book, Ponderings of a PPC Professional, tries to step above the what Google's done today fray. And by zooming out, and philosophically examining the big trends. I think Kirk's theological training is coming through there. That way he does that, it frames issues such that it equips PPC marketers to deal with them, whether it's now, a year from now, or maybe even a decade from now. And I'm very excited to welcome our guest, Kirk Williams. I'm really excited to bring on today's guest, Kirk Williams. Good to talk to you, Kirk. Thank you, Glenn. It is fantastic to be here. Yeah, really glad to have you. And you've now joined the ranks of book authors. <laughs> That's great. I guess. That's what they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the name of the book is called Ponderings of a PPC Professional. And I have to really work to get that right. Um, but it's uh, it's a... Very good. It, it, the subtitle kind of points out it's a collection, right? It has some observations and uh, it's aiming to describe the world as you've seen it from a um, person who's come up through the ranks and now owns your own agency with that. Have I got that right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm impressed that you got the title right because I don't even remember it half the time. <laughs> like, I, I, ser- like, seriously, if you put me on the spot and said, tell me exactly what the subtitle is, I don't think I could do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, people who are listening to, you know, our podcast, uh, some are in the, the PPC sphere. And, you know, I want to just let them know before they think of going anywhere that um, the title notwithstanding, I think you've got a lot in here that applies to any marketer. Uh, and I, and I think how that was signaled was in the very first few pages of the book with a story that you tell, um, you maybe want to take us through it, how you lost a deal and, you know, it severely bummed you out, but what was it that they slagged you for? Yeah. I mean, it was just one of those, we were doing our thing, trying to sell and, um, 
I, and I, I'm forgetting, I think I had the exact dates in there even, but you know, where I think this was, gosh, was it like 2013? Was it that far ago? I don't remember. Um, but it was, uh, for a job, like a career type of a, of a company. And we sent them over the proposal and that very day, I think it was, I think I sent over the proposal. We worked it up the day before, sent it over that morning. You know, we're, you know how it is when you send a proposal, yeah. you're kind of amped up like, okay, I, I think we got a good chance at this, right? Yeah. I feel like we did a great job. And that afternoon, I remembered seeing on Twitter that Google had just released their just their huge like career search. It was kind of this like we're we're taking over the career search space, you know? Yes. And um I don't remember all the exact chain of events, but because a lot has happened since then. But I think it was either um it might have been, you know, a few days later or that we're, you know, we'll usually check in on people. Hey, haven't heard from you. Did you have any questions on and that? And he let he let us know, yeah, we've gone mm-hmm. with someone else. Um and I, I often, and I think this is good practice to get into basically, okay, well, thanks for letting me know. Um, you know, never, never burden bridges, right? Right. Just, you know, being very polite. And, and if there's, if there's anything, any advice that you could give, like if there's a specific reason you went with someone else, if you want mind responding, let me know. Um, that way I can improve my sales process. So I, I'll, I'll often ask that and not, not a lot of people will respond, but some do. Um, and he, and he said, Hey, yeah, actually probably the main thing, he said there were two things. The main thing was that Google released that career builder thing. And like you, you hadn't said anything in your proposal. Um, and like, I don't usually like, those are the situations where I, I, I realize that we're not in there to argue. That's fine. But I did, I did like respond and say, just, just, just so you remember, like I actually sent that before Google <laughs> released the proposal. Right, and right. you let me know. Well, yeah, we would have expected that you would have, um, you would have contacted us back and had a had an adjustment to it, which you know maybe is fair. That was something I took. Whatever, that's fine. Right. Uh, but but if that was just the, yeah. The point still holds that the expectation is we marketers have to be up on everything. Everything is changing, and it can change at any time, and always. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, very matter of fact way, even if it wasn't humanly possible for you to do that, uh, that the just the outside view is, yeah, if you are dialed in, then, you know, you have to be dialed in all the time and you have to be ready to pivot at a moment's notice. And it, it, it can be tiring because yeah. of that. And I think, uh, so you mentioned 2013, and I would say that PPC professionals have probably been used to that sort of thing. For anybody listening to this who's not in that area, I would imagine, you know, here we are recording in the middle of 2021. I'd say the last year or two, you probably also have had your world rocked by <laughs> some changes, whether they are, you know, uh, public health related or in the marketing industry. Things haven't slowed down and more and more people are, are now seeing the kind of stuff that the likes of us, you know, have had to do for years. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the nature of, I don't want to say the game, but basically that is it right now, right? That's the nature of the game, especially, yeah, at this point, it's even expanded into life. Um, We as just a society are, are busier and busier. There's more and more change. If you think of what in the past 100 years, the amount of just kind of overall big picture societal changes happen. I mean, our, our grandparents, very likely many of our grandparents possibly spent at least some time in a home with an outhouse without indoor plumbing. Yikes. And, and now we are, you know, we're, we're, we're years and years past landing someone on the moon. We're into all sorts of complex technical change. There's just, it's just never ending change that we're living in throw that, you know, throw marketing into the mix of that. And then especially digital side of things and all that and all that change. And you really do have to be aware of the fact that that's just, that's just kind of the nature of, of it. And you, you got to figure out in some ways, you got to figure out how to deal with that both, both personally and mentally. Um, and then professionally as well. And I think you're a good guy to talk to about this because, you know, the, 
stories that you tell in the book, um, that's where you're trying to get to. You're trying to, uh, you could have written something that was, you know, up to the minute current and then, you know, it wouldn't be right. I mean, here we are six months out and I'm looking at it again today and it is, you know, still showing uh, just as much freshness uh, in its thinking. Is this, is this something that, you know, you have as a philosophy that we just have to, you know, build up the muscle or build up the kind of mental framework to be able to say, yep, here's another change that comes. And instead of letting it, you know, overwhelm me, uh, I need to think about the things like it in the past that I've grappled with and how I've successfully dealt with those. And I'm sure I'll crack the code with this one too. Well, and I think that's that's a big part of life in general. Um, for me, with this book specifically, thinking through, all right, the very specific channel of paid search marketing, paid search advertising. Um, I, I just, I think that there are always going to be ways of seeing something. Maybe that would be philosophies or um, ways that that you kind of understand and, and can and can look at something. And the more that you're able to identify those big picture things, I think that's part of what allows you, you know, helps ground you for a lot of those changes. And so that's, that's a big part of why in the book, I, I kind of didn't want to get into the technical this is how this automation works. This is how that, some of that is, I'm probably not the guy for that, to be honest. Like, um, you know, a, a guy like Patrick Gilbert or Fred Valais, I mean, they have deep background in machine learning and kind of seeing these things. So like, I'm probably just not going to be the guy who's going to be, um, you know, kind of figuring out exactly the way that Google's algorithm works. <laughs> I mean, and that, and that's fair. Um, we have pros and we all, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And, and one of the things though, I think that I want to do is look at, Hey, are there ways in a big picture way first that we need to be tying marketing back into paid search more? Um, because we can let all of the little changes with Google, you know, them pulling search terms away, them then pushing more and more smart bidding. We can let those changes really kind of throw us. And there are there are things about those that we need to think about, maybe even push back on with Google. And but but the in in some ways though, the bigger picture, if we really understand and have a nailed down, here's what marketing is, and here's here's how to here's how to find who the right audience is for this product. And here's the way to present that to them in, in kind of a winsome way that helps them understand the benefits of that. Here's where they, here's where they are and kind of how I can meet them. Kind of those bigger picture marketing things. As, as we, as we understand that, um, I think that's where we can, in the world of PBC, start to navigate the ebbs and flows of all the tiny little technical things or sometimes not so tiny changes that will occur because we still kind of have those bigger picture things in mind. So yeah, let's understand attribution a little bit better and how that should, that should impact how we're, you know, tracking conversions. Let's understand, okay, what is big picture automation way? So all of that stuff is kind of what I try to think through in the book, even getting into some things like agency client relationships, things like that too. That's right. Right. That's why the subtitle is like, they're random. They're, they're basically <laughs> random thoughts. <laughs> I agree with you on that uh, issue of we're best to think about how we can be prepared. Um, maybe we don't need to, you know, suss out the exact reason why uh, these changes continue to happen. Uh, it reminds me something of the whole argument over in psychology about nature versus nurture. You know, maybe it doesn't matter. I, I do think and you've mentioned some of the technical people, um, that it is the nature, just speaking specifically to paid search uh, people for a moment, uh, I think it is in their nature to actually push the envelope. Remember that the one who's nurturing us, Google, has created an auction. So we're all you know type A competitive people looking at the ways that this system, with its many configurable choices can be used for our own or our own client's advantage. So I do think we're actually part of what propels this forward because we're always, you know, jabbing new things at this. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the folks uh, in Mountain View are looking at it and saying, oh, well, they've done that. 
hmm, ah, I see what we can do now. And, you know, <laughs> it just keeps <laughs> snowballing. Uh, but I don't think it matters, you know, how it gets there. I think what's more important is, as you say, uh, having thoughts about how you can, you know, get an overall view of what you're trying to accomplish, take that kind of holistic marketing that you talk about and, you know, see how, see how you can make the best with the tools that, that we currently have and be ready for it to change. Right. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned, you mentioned Google. I just want to ask a little bit more on your kind of pro Google or anti Google thing. Again, as paid search people, you know, for the rest of the marketers out there, they might look at us and go, okay, you guys are always in Google's hip pocket because you work, you know, on their platform all day. How are you with that? Yeah, well, and let me let me quick speak to what you noted before, which I, I really appreciate. And I actually want to make sure I communicate. I, I'm definitely not saying, um, like if someone would be listening to this, I want to make sure I'm communicating clearly. I'm not saying... Eh, the technical stuff doesn't matter. Throw it out. Nature, nurture, who cares? Get the bigger picture. I, I agree completely. Um, I think in some ways, like, that is exactly what you noted. That's exactly the strength probably that those who are good PPCers do is that they really are digging into those technical aspects, really trying to figure it out, trying to crack it. Even It's funny you say the nature, nurture thing because even I have, like, I, I like kind of chewing on that as I think about my kids, that sort of thing. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a helpful in that sort of thing. Like where, where does philosophy and big picture stuff come in and where does like some of that smaller, more technical stuff come in? There really does need to be a both and it's not an either or. Yeah. Um, so I, I would just, I would want to make sure that no one is hearing me say, yeah, that technical stuff doesn't matter. Cause I, I really do think, I think that we need to take the time to figure out like, Hey, what impact does have losing our search terms have on things? Is is that a good move or not? How is that going to impact things? Um, but then also keeping that big picture. So let's anyways. let's let's use. So that is the elephant in the room. It has been for a, a while here. The, <laughs> uh, the the fact that Google in what September of 2020 um, started saying we're not going to show you all the search terms that are. Um, related to keywords, which we put your you in the auction for. Um, and, you know, I'll have links in the show notes for anyone who wants to read up on uh, what happened there. But, you know, take me through. Do you do you view Google as the big bad wolf here? Do you have um, kind of your own view on it? I know you dedicate pretty much a chapter to, you know, what actually mm -hmm. is afoot and how this may not be the only time where data is going to be reduced, this might be a, a trend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't think at this point anyone would be surprised to hear someone suggest it's a trend because um, I think we're all expecting that, right? Just things are getting more and more automated and more and more obfuscated in terms of data. Yep. Some of that, that big question is, is, is that is that best for the industry? Is 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 it is it just Google that that's serving? Is that actually best for the industry? Google likes to claim that it's best for the industry because they're, in some ways, they're they're the they're the Mary Poppins nanny saying, "I know you don't like your medicine, but take your medicine. It's good for you." Um, I, th I think that's how they see themselves, kind of in that. Yeah, I know you think you like search terms, but actually, this is what's better for you. That you're not always tweaking the campaign stuff like that. I I have I have sympathies on both sides, and this has even evolved actually since I I wrote that chapter. Ironically, especially in my keyword chapter, um, I just wrote an article. Well, just maybe it was three months ago or so on search engine land. So that might be a good one to kind of kind of read through. This stuff is interesting. Someone. And basically talking through um, par part of what I'm arguing for in that article is I, I think search terms, I think there's an argument for search terms actually don't quite show us as much intent as we maybe think they do. But, oh. but so there's that part of it, yeah. which, which could be, you know, we could get into, but I really lay it out in detail in that article. Um, but even more so than that, so that's almost like, okay, here's a thought. What if, what if, what if these search terms, what if someone's saying, um, you know, this, uh, you know, Samsung TV, what if one person typing in Samsung TV has 
just entirely different by intent than another person typing in Samsung TV, right? So in that sense, like that query really isn't necessarily helping us that much. Of course, then we as PPCR, you know, marketers would say, well, right. And that's why we utilize lots of historical data. So we, we gather that data, we get those clicks, we see over time, how has Samsung TV as an exact match keyword done? And then we'll act accordingly. Um, but some of my argument is, has has the product Google search itself changed enough to start to start influencing people's search searching behavior to be less and less clear in their intent? I would argue heartily yes, which yeah. again is is one of those things where you know back years ago. Um, there might be a stronger argument for it. like, yeah, we really need to see those search terms. It's really crucial. And, and now um, more and more people because of things like, you know, Google's like instant search and autocomplete and, and, and even the fact that as Google's search product has gotten better, and again, I lay all this out in detail in this article, as Google's search product has gotten better, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm looking for a place near me, um, I just, I just know if I type in a couple of those words that Google has enough data on me at this point, and I just kind of know that intuitively, I'm I'm not typing out those long tail keywords like I used to. And I think there's, I, and I've been trying to find search data that actually shows that happening. It's really hard to find that if Google doesn't share it, but I, but I do suspect that that's happening more with everyone. And so as search behavior is actually changing, are the words that we literally type in, are hiding intent more than it used to be. That's that's my long-winded way of getting to that. So no, I, I, I like it. I think yeah. uh, I mean I think another symptom that we see, and I'll talk about what the reaction of the crowd has been uh, over this time. You know, I, I see a number of people who are um, you know still angered by it, and uh, I guess the the narrative that they go with is. Um, whatever information they're withholding from us, it must be that the algorithm is being uh, pulled wider and wider, right? It's, it's bringing in more and more unrelated search terms. And I bet that they're hiding it because they don't want me to see how bad it is. And, you know, this narrative they just want is, to spend my money. They yeah. just want to spend my money. And this narrative is kind of hinged on the uh, assumption that, Google wants to take their uh, take the search engine results page in two different directions. That they want the uh, organic results to be better and better, but that they want the paid results to be worse and worse. Right? That's kind of and the example you just gave about how much Google knows about you, and you're maybe going in through a voice search, and you know you're just giving the little few pieces, and it's having to figure out the rest of the context and you know, interpret that with all the other signals you give. Um, I, I kind of agree. I, I think now I'm not saying that Google has good intentions. They, right. they are very no, no, no. lopsided. You know, they have this black box and, you know, they're kind of like an arms dealer. They make money on both sides. Um, but I can see what you're saying, that if we broaden and we let go of the search term as being the main way that we can judge if a campaign is accurate or not, if we let go of that, then I think we'd be willing to accept that we could see good performance. The one thing though that uh, causes you know a snag here is we don't get metrics on those other things to tell us, yes, Google did notice that there was you know a signal the person gave right. somehow else that indicated your ad was the perfect thing for them to see right there. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm certainly in no way communicating any sort of opinion on what I think Google's motivation is. Um, honestly, positively or negatively, I think the people who are always jumping down their throats about saying, "Yeah, they are just totally doing this for their their bottom line." In some ways, yes, of course, they're a business, but I also respect. Um, businesses 
are sometimes better and sometimes worse at seeing beyond the initial bottom line and seeing into the future. So I don't, I don't necessarily think Google makes every single quick snap decision about what will give them a few more dollars tomorrow. Um, and so just always having that mindset, it's sometimes makes me roll my eyes a little bit. The flip side is I'm, I'm certainly not going to be the one to communicate. Oh yeah. I totally trust Google's motivation and they're, they're, they're completely altruistic and for the good of, of the world and the, and the person. Cause I, I don't think that, I mean, they're, they're a publicly traded company. I, I just, I think that primarily what they're trying to do is what every publicly traded company is trying to do, which is basically like keep the investors happy. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, and so in, in that sense with motivations, um, that's where then I'll, I'll just try to, to kind of think through, yeah, what are what are things that don't make sense here? And then what are things that even if PBCers initially gut reaction is upset, what are things that could make sense? One of the things that they have said about that specific thing from the beginning, the, the search queries, is that it's all about privacy. And that is one thing that I'm still not fully – uh, it, it, it could be. I just still do not quite fully understand that piece of the puzzle. And I was on a um, – it was actually a Twitter Spaces, I think, kind of a you know an audio hangout with um, Ginny Marvin who used to be Search Engine Land. Now she's the Google Ads liaison. Um, and and one of the things you know some of us were communicating to her is you know this sort of thing – The more that Google, you know, I know that you can't always give us information, but when you say things like, hey, it's about privacy, but then there are still things that just don't add up. So you'll say, we'll, we'll, we'll show, we'll show search terms if there are, um, I forget the exact verbiage they use, but it's like, if there are a significant number, Yeah. clearly there's, there's some way, like you're not throwing a dart. And changing what significant means in terms of value every time that search is run. So clearly there's some way of figuring that out. Like, can you just help us understand that? Like, are there – have, have you discovered that someone's privacy is at risk if there's under 20 searches done for this specific long tail term? And so that's why you can't do it. Oh, okay, I guess then we know there's 20. We might even disagree, but there's just more information. Yeah. And that's not something that Google has done in any way to help no. with this and situation. You, so. you point out, you know, and I'll just read off one thing that you said here. Uh, I thought it was a, a great suggestion, but you kind of mentioned it's probably not one that Google will take up on. <laughs> you said they should have increased the advances in automation to, to those who don't care about specific control and data access. Plus, you know, that they should keep part of their platform with full access to the data sets for those advertisers who believe they need it. Um, I think, you know, if we're imagining what it's like inside their boardroom, maybe there's a big Venn diagram with a circle for each one of those audiences, but I bet you the circle that has the, those who will continue to pay, even if we don't give them access, that's a bigger circle. And so they're willing to park, you know, the, it's like they're willing to say goodbye to the ones who say, but I want 2013 back. Um, They're they're just willing to say, no, the the, the train has left the station and you're going. And let's never forget that the other main stakeholder that they care about, possibly even more than advertisers and agencies, is the user. Yep. Right? Have have you, I know you mentioned on our, you know, as we were discussing before we started recording about Patrick Gilbert joined it. I have you read his book yet? Halfway through it. Okay. Yeah. So he'll, I mean, he'll definitely, and he makes, you know, phenomenal case in my opinion, he'll definitely fall more on the camp of, yeah, we shouldn't go back to 2013 because, you know, the, the amount of data and what the machines are able to do is just far beyond our, our abilities. Um, and so I, I know that there's kind of that line of thinking as well. Not, not just simply that we should have, Two, two levels of this is a more automated solution. I mean, Google even did this a little bit back yeah. in the day with Express, you know, yeah. Google Ads Express, right? Um, so, and I, I am I am definitely sympathetic to that. And I'm, I'm still, I feel like I'm still learning on that as well. Just that idea of here are all the things happening 
in a search and here are all the things happening in, in an auction when Google is calculating that. And there's just no way we as humans can keep up on every single aspect of that. Right. So there's one hand where I've, I've leaned into automation more than, more than ever in the last six, 12 months. The flip side though, and this goes back again to that balance I'm just constantly trying to hit is, okay, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, you know, for instance, let's talk smart shopping campaigns and those who really push, I mean, I've, I've talked like to Patrick Gilbert about these things too. We've, we've chatted, we've done a podcast and that together um, where, you know, Okay, so let's say we start losing things like in smart shopping campaigns, you don't get audience data, you don't get search term data, all that. Okay, and for um, our listeners who don't know those, uh, tell us what a regular shopping campaign would have. Sure, yeah. So standard shopping campaign um, will, you know, once you once you set a bid, you're basically saying, hey, let's 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 advertise these specific products that we've uploaded through Google Merchant Center with a feed and it gets a little bit more complicated than that but um, then then with those shopping ads let's advertise those specific products and you can use you know manual or smart bidding but um, once you have once you've been advertising those you can see the search term data coming in what what searches did people use to see your products and click or purchase Kirk, can, can I dumb it can I dumb it down to something as simple as if I think of myself as a shop owner with a regular search campaign, I can figure out what to put in the front window. And with a spark shopping campaign, I'm telling Google all the way from the front to the back of the store, I'm allowing you to take the buyer to whatever you think they're going to buy. That's, that's interesting. And yeah, maybe even, the buyer is walking by outside and like the smart shopping algorithm, like grabs something from inside and it's like, Hey, this is what you want to see. That's, a, yeah, that's, that's an interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, so, so standard shopping, you'll have some of that data with smart shopping. You don't, well, here's, here's an example where, you know, Google engineers have, have, have basically said this. Um, I've, I've literally talked to uh, product leads in that at like Google and marketing live and that, and they've communicated um, that's one of those times where the reason that stuff is obfuscated, hidden, is so that like advertisers aren't aren't pushing buttons or wanting to push buttons. So so that that's why. Well, a, a great example of why that is actually not overly helpful, aside from there being broader business assistance that can be gained just from insights, is um, so if you want to run a a title test in a product in shopping ads. So you want to cha- take your product title and you want to say, Hey, maybe we should try throwing in, you know, I'm trying to sell a basketball and I don't say the word basketball anywhere in this product. Maybe we should test putting basketball in the title. So then Google sees that and says, this will match to basketball search terms. Um, so you'll, you'll run that. And with smart shopping campaigns, you can't actually, analyze for that specific word or phrase that you added in. And this is how, this is how I've, I've run search uh, product title tests in the past is to, to analyze that, that, that time and to take that specific um, phrase that I put into the title and just to see like what's grown in terms of impression share and click yep. share and sales and all that stuff, clicks, all that stuff. You, you can't do that. Um, and so Google is saying, right now it's time guys optimize the feed. There's an example of like, we can optimize the feed in a really important way, right? Like that actually, because yeah. we, we, that we used to be able to drop into Excel and you took away our Excel and now we are like, it's like Schrodinger's cat in the box. We don't know. Is it alive? Is it dead? Yeah. No idea. So, so I, I def, I, I just feel like I definitely fall on both sides of seeing. Yeah. I think we're moving in a direction that actually is good for the industry overall. I think a lot of what Google's doing with automation is helpful and good. And they're, they're, as Patrick will point out, they're analyzing millions of data signals within a single auction that we, we just can't. That's fine. Great. Let's do it. But also like the baby is very much being thrown out with the bathwater in my opinion. Um, and that's what I'm also trying to slow down. So yeah. I think in a number of ways, and I, as you get further into the book, you kind of get more personal uh, about the reader and, you know, you talk about how they need to deal with PPC and like, as you said, later on, you get into how they would deal if they're a freelancer or an agency. 
even if it's not PPC, you know, the kind of standard thinking that uh, they need to have. Are you uh, upbeat about how, you know, someone who's out of school or maybe a few years into their career, you know, do you think it's a good time for them to be in this general area of marketing? And, you know, do you, do you, is that why you wrote those sections to try and say to them, hey, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, you can see guys like Kirk and Glenn shaking their fist, but, you know, trust me, it's a good time to be a marketer. Um, I, yes and no. <laughs> I think that, I, I think that just simply additional automation taking over tasks that humans used to do is, is, is absolutely just going to have an, an effect yeah. on especially probably like the newer, younger entering this space. A lot of times in the past, those were the type of people that you would utilize to run big spreadsheet, um, you know, run, run those big things where they're looking for data, you're doing data mining, whatever it might be. And, and they would think that it was that spreadsheet slicing that is their career skill. Right. And, and that's gone. <laughs> right. That is gone. But I guess kind of. what, what you kind of talk about in the book is, you know, it's, it's your thinking. It's how you see what's going on. And, you know, I'm going to get kind of Star Wars here. And I know you're a Star Wars buff, but, you know, maybe it's a little bit more of the force. You know, you just have to feel it. Well, and and I think that there will be definitely some people like that who are especially more on the technical side um, who are probably going to struggle or maybe struggle to find a job or should look into something else, be like go become an engineer. Um, but I, I do think that there's always a place and I, and I think PPC is no different. So in that way, like so in that way, yes, automation is taking some jobs. And then the way, like, no, automation is not taking jobs. The person who really understands marketing well and how to, you know, work with paid search in how it, how it fits into overall, like, overall channels, channel strategy isn't just focused on that channel alone. Um, the person who can really communicate well with clients, you know, whatever it might be, um, that that person will definitely still have a career and, and, and be fine. Um, so I think in that way, it's changing things in some ways. Um, but the, yeah, the, the go getter who is focused on really understanding how to do marketing well and how to communicate well with people, I think, I think it's going to be fine. You have, um, in the time that you've been in the industry, um, risen to, you know, a pretty high level of prominence. And uh, when when some people think uh, there's, you know, only one person at the top of that pyramid, never, you know, they got to climb over everybody on the ladder to get there, um, you know, and I think they meet you and talk to you for five minutes, they realize that's not how you look at things at sure. all. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to call it a place in the book where, you know, you point out that anything that you have been able to uh, attain through your own uh, work, you know, you reflected on the privilege uh, that you've had, you know, country and the, you know, kind of economic class that, you know, you came from and, you know, access to technology and schooling and stuff like that. Uh, but you make a point that there are people who have been disadvantaged and that have not had even those things. Uh, you know, you kind of call out that entitlement. Just tell me, you know, a bit about how, how do you, how do you reckon that? How do you, why did you make a point of uh, saying that it's uh, not often that people who are writing a book, which can sometimes be a look at me kind of exercise, you made a special point to turn it around and say, you know, look at you. If you don't have all these advantages, you too can get in this field or you too can learn or you too can contribute to the conversation. Yeah. I, I remember vividly a specific time where I was driving, I was driving up Shiloh, Shiloh road here in Billings. And I was listening to a podcast and it was by an agency owner and he was, it was some by an agency owner that I think has done a great job. I respect. Um, so this is not a dig on him. Actually, it was just one of those kind of light bulb moments where yeah. He, he just has done a phenomenal job growing this huge agency. 
Um, and as he was talking, he was talking through some of the things of how he got started and when he started the agency, because uh, this agency started uh, years after I started mine. Mine's basically a decade old. Um, we have we have five people, you know, we're pretty small. Um, and and he noted he, he, he just he just happened to note a few of the things of what caused him to get started. And I, and I believe if I remember specifically what he's saying, it was kind of this like my partners. And then because of because of where I had worked before, I, I started reaching out to my network and I immediately landed these these, ma- you know, these major clients that allowed me to start hiring. And I was thinking like it was almost this this kind of light bulb moment where I'm like, I, I am really happy for him. Like, I don't. I don't begrudge him at all that he was able to establish those connections. And then he, he made that leap out and then he used those networking. I mean, that's great. That's very wise of him, but it, it did really hit me where I was like, I did not have those opportunities at all. Right. Which is fine, which is fine. But that's also where it was one of those, man, I just, I just don't need to really compare myself to him in any way, shape or form because yeah. we are completely separate individuals. Yeah. We're on completely separate paths. Um, a lot of the stuff probably that that individual had learned at his other agencies, I, I'm learning as I go with mine. So like I'm unfortunately having to make those mistakes like in my own business. And um, and I think I think that along with just a lot of other things was where I just I, I just wanted to communicate that I, you know, that one of the cool things about the Internet, social media, digital work is I really do think there's some level of anyone can kind of get into a space and get to know people and start to form a network and work hard. And, um, and, and, and then there's going to be, there's going to be stuff that just, just comes to you. Some people call that luck. Some people call it Providence um, that you had nothing to do with sure. and kind of all of that together makes, makes something. And so some of that was just this encouragement to people of don't worry about comparing yourself to others. Yeah. Just, just f- like figure out, what it is that you have strengths on. Cause all of us have different strengths and weaknesses, lean into that strength, like pick something maybe that is a strength of yours and kind of use that to help market yourself as a brand online. Um, and just, just get to work, I guess. Yeah. It takes, I think a maturity to acknowledge that, that, uh, people are at differing levels of access to opportunities. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't take away any of the onus on us when an opportunity is in front of us to take the next step up. I think the next step for you, you tell me if I'm wrong, uh, we're both part of you know a, a conference that is well known in the paid search community called HeroConf. And you had, uh, like I said, you're, you know, uh, you have wonderful things to say and you did, you know, put some guest articles out there, but you know, if I were to go back to, I don't know, HeroConf, you know, 2015, 2016, I don't think, you know, aside from having a, an attendee badge, you know, Kirk Williams would be, you know, a household name. And yet, you know, you you hinted that there were times where people did want you to, you know, sit at the edge of a panel and, you know, maybe you weren't saying as much as some of the higher profile people but when it was your turn, you had a, a well-reasoned thought and you spoke it. And I'm making the leap here. What you're saying in the book about how someone needs to use the mind that they've been given and when they've thought deeply about a situation and have something to say about it, if they're all of a sudden sitting there and the mic is put in front of them, that they should open their mouth. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. See, see those opportunities and take them for sure. Because that's what you did. Yeah. I tried to. I'm sure I missed a lot too. (laughs) Um, Is there anything that you would say about what actually brought you to the next step of writing this book? I mean, it's wonderful to have this, you know, now it's, you know, going to be something that, you know, I, I hand to team members. It's, great. The permanence of a book is an awesome thing, but it's also very daunting to, you know, say, I'm going to sit down and write a book and you've got, you know, a family, you've got this agency, you know, things are going concern. And, you know, you went ahead and said, I'm going to do this anyway. Tell me about what, what was behind that. I mean, I've always wanted to, it's definitely been a bucket list. Um, 
thing, and I and I think probably the pandemic was a big part of that, where um, us, like everyone else, just had more time than usual. So um, I, I have friends who do kind of make fun of me a little bit. You know, sometimes your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. And I kind of have this itchy, I just don't like to sit around doing nothing, even though then I start to get stressed out and like burned out. <laughs> right. But then if I try to like sit down and relax, I'm like, okay, now what's the next thing? Um, and unfortunately <laughs> for us in a not good way, like both my, me and my wife are like that as well. So sometimes like we've even had friends who kind of like very helpfully and lovingly are like, it's time for you guys to slow down a little bit. And we're like, no, actually it is like, we need to, this is not sure. good. Sure. So, well, so rest, yeah. rest and mental health is important. Um, yeah, but it, but is, it, it is hard to see your own blind spot. And I think, you know, <laughs> once you begin writing a book, even if it turns out to be way more than you bargained for, you know, you're already in it. So, yeah, exactly. you know, so we just started. The, yeah. the quickest so way out of the tunnel is straight ahead. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, just uh, finish up with saying if people wanted to find out more, uh, you, you seem to have actually even added more goodness uh onto your social media accounts recently with some of your guitar playing in your songs yeah. right so you're you're now kind of totally unfettered we're getting <laughs> uh kirk unplugged um where can people go to find that stuff to listen to some of those great songs and uh to find out more about you uh yeah P pvc kirk um pvc kirk is pretty much in all the social media profiles um my agency is zatomarketing.com as well so fantastic and the name of the book is ponderings of a ppc professional we'll have links to all that kirk i'm so glad that you were able to join us on the show and for people who have been listening to this thank you and i think it if you got some value out of today uh, i would hope that you would share this or go read the book. Uh, either one is going to propel you, I believe, to grow a little bit more as a marketer. And if you uh, find somebody who would benefit from the talk or from uh, what we have uh, given us by Kirk, go ahead and share that with them. Um, the podcast is available wherever you listen to your audio. And if you have any feedback, go ahead and reach out to me at Fun Reboot or at Kate Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.